great physicist Max Planck says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Interesting words. All right, let's go back into history. Let's go back into the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks, we had several famous Greek mathematicians. We had people like Archimedes, Pythagoras, Euclid, we had a number of famous Greek mathematicians. But when the Romans came along, we did not have any famous Roman mathematicians. And it wasn't because the Romans were somehow dumber than the Greeks. It was because of the numbering system they were using. It's because they used Roman numerals. Roman numerals here happens to be a pretty stupid numbering system, but in defense of the Romans, there happened to be a lot of stupid numbering systems at that time. The reason it was so inferior is it, didn't, it wasn't a placeholder numbering system. You didn't have the ones, the tens, the hundreds, the thousands. Every number itself was an equation, and that prevented them from doing any higher math. This is a big concept here. An entire civilization was prevented from doing any higher math because of the system that they were using. The logical question then we should be asking is what systems do we employ today that are the equivalent to Roman numerals that are preventing us from doing great things? Ah, there happens to be a lot of them. We have a half-implemented metric system. We're buying 3.2-liter car engines. We're putting in quarts of oil. <laughs> we have a calendar system. 31 days some months, 30 days other months, and then you have February. And we have daylight savings time. Who the heck invented daylight savings time? And then the mother of all boat anchors around our neck happens to be our tax code. <laughs> it occupies entirely too much of our intellectual bandwidth. Uh, a good friend of mine, he recommended that the next time we do our taxes, we should actually do them in Roman numerals and then send them in. <laughs> All right, quick show of hands. How many of you have used slide rolls? Wow, darn near everybody. <laughs> You're an interesting crowd here. <laughs> 1972, I was a young engineering student at South Dakota State University. I was told I needed to take a class in slide rolls. And I remembered going up and arguing with the teacher at the time, do I really need to take this class because calculators were available? a little expensive at the time, but they were available. And the teacher pretty much dismissed me saying, hey, all engineers need to know how to run slide rolls. So I took the class and I passed it, uh, but I've never used a slide roll since then. Uh, the entire time I worked at IBM, nobody I worked with ever used slide rolls. The conversation I had with the teacher is one that the engineers at Hewlett Packard and Texas Instrument that time would have laughed at knowing what was coming down the pike. This is the end of an era. This is the end of a slide rule era and the beginning of another era, the beginning of the calculator era. So I drew this out on a piece of paper and I was looking at that for a little while and I thought, you know, the real interesting part is right here in the middle. And being the arrogant guy that I am, I thought, you know, that's, that's a naming opportunity. I could name that space there. So I did. I came up with a name for it. The name I came up with was Maximum Freud. And you look at that and you say, wow, what a stupid name. I, I gotta agree with you, but somehow it fits because this is the time when you spend most of your time on the Freudian couch trying to figure out what's going on. Lots of chaos, but also lots of opportunity. But here's the thing, all technology ends. Every piece of technology that you're using today will someday go away and get replaced with something else. As a futurist, I look for those anchor points in the future that I can, that I can crystallize my thinking around. And one of them that I can predict with absolute certainty is that all technology will end. Every computer, every handheld device, every laptop that you're using today will someday go away and get replaced with something else. So let's talk about the new age of retail here. We now have over 100 million products in the marketplace. 
and each one's looking for its own customer base. So there's a lot of noise in the marketplace. But I'm talking about the age of hyper-individuality because we now believe there's a product out there to solve any problem, need, or desire that we might have. The categories that we used to use in order to organize marketplaces, we were painting with far too broad a brush strokes. We need to fine tune those. They need to be much more granular. With the explosion of data that we're receiving now from, from the cell phone world, from the internet world, from credit card world, the people that can make sense of all that are redefining the world around us. And here's the key thing. Every personality trait that can be sorted mathematically defines the basis for a new market. Last year I gave a talk to the people at Frito-Lay and we were talking about this whole idea of hyper-individuality because when you go into a grocery store, you have your choice of 47 different kinds of chips to pick from. And I suggested that they could do away with that much shelf space and go with one machine designed for the hyper-individualized hyper customer. And so I cobbled up this, this piece of artwork here and in the top, you start with hoppers of either chips or crackers or pretzels or nuts. And you can decide on what your combination of those would be. They go into a blender and you can mix in whatever spices and seasonings you want. And then it comes down in the bottom and it would bag it for you individually and print your name on that bag. Now, how cool is that? <laughs> okay, some of the jobs in 2030. I pulled out my crystal ball and here's what I came up with. Body part and limb maker. Okay. You're probably not aspiring to that one, but maybe. An organ agent. Memory augmentation therapist. If you're forgetting a lot of things, you, you need somebody to go to. A nanomedic. These are those really, really tiny guys that work on medicine, new science ethicist, time broker. Everybody's running out of time. Where do you get more time? You go to the time broker, of course. Waste data manager. We're creating a lot of crappy data, so we need to get rid of some of it. Space tourism. Geoengineering. We need people to control the weather. I think that's a good job. Urban agriculturalist, plant psychologist. Some of you could actually have to go to man anger management school because you've been cussing at your plants. It's a business colony manager, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Landfill miners. I've often thought that the, the most valuable property in cities in the future is gonna be the landfills because that's where all the natural resources are. Lots of raw material in there. Avatar designers and managers. Augmented reality architects. Narrow casters as opposed to broadcasters. Robot polishers. If we're gonna make robots, we need somebody to polish them. And the one that uh, I think is probably the most important of all of them is the executioners for virus builders. I would vote for that one for sure. <laughs> Close to broadcasters. Robot polishers. If we're gonna make robots, we need somebody to polish them. And the one that uh, I think is probably the most important of all of them is the executioners for virus builders. <laughs> I would vote for that one for sure. <laughs> Now the empire of one is a new emerging business model and I see it cropping up everywhere. The empire of one is that one person business with far reaching influence. And a lot of times it's a one person practitioner, whether it's a dentist or a chiropractor or a doctor. But a lot of times it's much more than that. You have products that are manufactured in China or India, sent to a distribution center in the US or Canada, and you have customers in Great Britain, Brazil, Germany, anywhere in the world. It's all controlled by one person. They are outsourcing everything. They're outsourcing manufacturing, operations, bookkeeping, legal, anything that they can outsource, they do. 
It eliminates HR problems. So people that are dropping out of the corporate world, this is a very appealing lifestyle to them. The freedom to travel. They work very hard, but they work when they want to, and they control their own destiny. Uh, a couple examples of this. On the top there is one called Superstrux. It's uh, Dave McCluskey, who is in Erie, Colorado, has, de has created Next Generation Tinker Toys. They're manufactured over in China, sent to his distribution center in Erie, Colorado, and then he has customers all over, all over the world. And he's selling around 250,000 units a year. Quite an impressive operation. Business colonies. Now, not everybody that starts an empire of one type business is good at all aspects of business. And so having these type of people congregate together under one kind of larger umbrella makes sense. And so the way the movie industry has worked for many years is you have a movie project and you have all these people come together for this movie project. You have writers, directors, you have lighting guys, camera guys, makeup people, actors and actresses. They all come together for this one movie project. Once it's over, then they all disappear and they come back together into another, the next project. It's a very organic process. And that's the way the business colonies would function. Now they can be very specific themes to these business colonies. And whether it's a um, video gaming business colony or whether it's a photonics colony or a nanotech colony or some other IT niche, there's lots of possibilities. And the way you would structure a business colony, the way you put it all together, is typically there's, there's lots of interesting components that would come into play. So that can all be figured out as you decide going down that path. I actually, I actually see in the business colony world that a lot of corporations will start working with business colonies as a way to pass off a lot of the, the consulting work that they have. They'll experiment with things, they'll try new things out, and it would logically, it would make sense to go to this business colony. So there's a good win-win relationship that would go in there. Future transportation. This is a hot topic in a lot of cities. We're becoming increasingly mobile. 1950, there was 50 million people that crossed borders. Last year, it was 840 million people. We have roughly 60 million new cars that are being manufactured every year in the world. 243 million of them are owned in the US. The life expectancies of cars is increasing. 6.5 years in 1990, now the life expectancy is 8.9 years and growing. United Nations put together a study that talked about the rise of the global middle class. And by the middle class, they mean anybody that makes more than $4,000 a year. Now based on their, their study, and we still don't know exactly what effect the re recent recession is going to have on this, but they were predicting that the size of the middle class was going to more than double by 2030. So one of the first things these people are going to want to buy is a new car to give them the freedom that, that they've never had. Car ownership in the United States has got increasingly expensive. Uh, Hawaii and California are the top two most expensive states. This is the cost of over a five-year period of time. It's almost $1,000 a month. On the other end of the spectrum is the Tata Nano, a $2,500 car being manufactured in, in India right now. It's very well designed for the Indian market. And they're going to sell a lot of them. So the projected car population could grow massively. We could reach as many as 2.5 billion cars worldwide and suddenly we would see breaking points all along the way. We wouldn't have enough roads to drive them on, we wouldn't have enough fuel to run them, we wouldn't have enough parking spaces to park them in. So as a futurist, that's one of the things I look for, is I look for breaking points. So where does that go? I look at the possibility of having autonomous robotic transportation, driverless vehicles, and I don't see that very far away. 
we look at how the internet is developing right now, and this is a internet coverage in the United States the way it exists today. Within 10 years though, I would expect that to be pretty well blanketed. So anywhere you would drive in the country, you can be connected to the internet. That will give rise to on-demand transportation. So when you walk out of your house, you can take out your handheld device, you can punch in, I wanna to go to work, I wanna to go to the grocery store, I wanna to go to the school. A vehicle will stop by, pick you up, and take you to where you wanna go. And then it will pick somebody else up from there and take them to where they wanna go and take somebody from there and take them to where they wanna go. The cars we use today are very poorly utilized. If you look at how much time, what percentage of your day you spend using your car, if you're using it 3% of the time, that's a lot. 5% of the time, you're kind of off the charts. Very few people use their cars more than 5% of the time. So from a utilization of natural resources standpoint, this would actually make much more sense. And because of the fact that it's a driverless vehicle, you're not having to pay any salary and wages, so this is far cheaper than any taxis that, uh, uh, that are available right now. So let me talk about the future of transportation from a little different angle, from the alternative transportation standpoint. And we're seeing an absolute explosion of alternative transportation vehicles and there's no good roads or trails to drive them on. I'm gonna show you a few of them here. This is the, the OptiBike, it's made in Boulder. So it's a hybrid electric bicycle. This is a, a wheelchair. This is one sold in Best Buy, it's an electric motorcycle. This is an electric scooter sold in Sam stores. This is a fuel cell vehicle that's uh, on a drawing board for Daimler. Here's a fuel cell bicycle. This is a collapsible backpack bicycle, electric one. These are dog powered vehicles. This is a tiny one seater electric car. This is a two wheeled car that runs with a joystick. This is the electric pod car. The e-cooter over in Taiwan. The TVA Gazelle, it tilts when, you, when you're leaning into a curve, it tilts with you. This is a wearable motorcycle design. <laughs> the Peugeot high motion vehicle. The T3 motion is being used by police departments around the country. It's becoming quite popular. This is a mono tracer, an electric motorcycle. This is the unicycle, battery powered. And this is the self-balancing unicycle. This is a little personal chariot device here. Honda's walking assist device. <laughs> this probably looks a little weird, but it's actually quite the impressive uh, piece of technology. This is a one-wheeled car being worked on by Audi. Segway came up with this two-wheeled um, car, looks kind of funky. This is the winglet by Toyota. Put it between your legs and you can just drive around. The iReel from Toyota. This is the Uno, an electric one-wheeled motorcycle. Another electric scooter, another electric scooter, electro-positive electric car, Blue Angel, <clears throat> electric taxis. This, a f this is an interesting four-wheeled one. I'm not sure the purpose of that fourth wheel. The Dareway, it's a Segway for kids. The Eve, another electric car. This is the IQ electric car scooter. This is the Orbis, the Pixie, a wheelchair concept, the Sparrow, electric skateboards. This one's collapsible. This one's another kind of electric skateboard. <clears throat> These are Segways. The military's playing around with Segways. 
Golf courses are using segways. Some of the pizza delivery places are using segways. You can do advertising on segways. You can even put seats on them. These are some of the Segway knockoffs coming out of China. A Volvo concept vehicle, the AirPod, the stroller trikes, some of the Zigo carrier bicycles. The reason I showed you all of these, because there's literally thousands of them. This is just scratching the surface of some of them that I came across. The reason I showed you all these is because of, if we don't promote alternative transportation, we are by default promoting more car transportation. So if we don't create a place for these alternative vehicles and they don't mesh well with being on the roads, so there's an opportunity here. No cities are well equipped for this kind of transportation. Well, for this kind of car, I don't think we should ever make an exception. <laughs> but there's literally thousands of these vehicles out there and there's virtually no roads or trails to drive them on. So creating an alternative transportation district, I think there's a huge opportunity here. And if you, if you go down that path, all of the manufacturing companies, the distributorships, they will all want to be located in your city because it's, it's an alternative transportation friendly city. Lots of interesting options there.